Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I do want to point out that uh, this that that Dr. Sulzman is here today speaking at the invitation of the M3 EWB network, and we are very happy to have him. Uh, the M3 EWB network is uh, a, a group of uh, Sandy Chafolias, Amiko Heft, and I uh, working to promote research in emotional well-being, and we're one of six NIH sponsored networks um, trying to work together to uh, to make that happen. So, so we're delighted to have um, Dr. Salzman here today. And uh, I'll just say a little bit about his background. Um, he is currently associate professor in the Department of Social Sciences and Health Policy at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. He serves as director of clinical research in adolescent and young adult, also called AYA oncology and is co-leader of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at Wake Forest Baptist Comprehensive Cancer Center. He also serves as chair of the AYA subcommittee within the Health Equity Committee for ECOG Akron, and we were just talking yesterday about all these acronyms, but this is a, uh, acronyms, but this is a really important group because they um, are working to conduct um, research, clinical trials and such across the country. Um, so working together, um, so that's really great to, to have that involvement. And his work focuses on maximizing health-related quality of life of AYAs with cancer, both during and after treatment. He does this in three primary ways, improving measurement of patient-centered outcomes to give patients a voice, uh, identifying factors that promote resilience and thriving, and implementing behavioral interventions to foster psychological well-being. He has been continuously funded by NIH since 2006. He served as principal investigator on the National Cancer Institute funded work since 2011. And just on a personal note, I want to say that I've known John for a long time and he is such a delightful colleague. We've worked together. I think I was on his his K back in the day. Like it's just been a very long time and, and we've had a very productive um, collaboration, but also a lot of fun. and. John and I are two of the uh, of a very small subgroup um, that that does research on religiousness and spirituality and health. So um, we we kind of got to know each other through that. I think initially. So John, we're really delighted to have you. I know you have a really full talk, so I will turn it over to you. And I really wish you were here in person so I could take you out to dinner. But next time, maybe. Crystal, you took the words out of my mouth. I was getting ready to not only thank you for the invitation, but just to say how great it would be uh, for this to be in person. So, so soon, hopefully. Um, okay, can you see my title slide? Okay, great. Um, after two years of practice, I've, <laughs> I've got it down. I don't want to jinx it though, but... Um, so, so I will be talking about uh, psychological well-being, broadly defined or colloquially, what we refer to as the good stuff in life. And the way that I've set up the presentation, I've, I've split it up into uh, three core sections, assessment, how we understand and measure that, uh, a descriptive observational approach of what we see in the research literature about efforts to improve that. And then lastly, I'll be talking a little bit about work that we're doing in my lab to improve well-being among post-treatment adolescent young, young adult cancer survivors. I do have to put in a caveat here that with the way my brain works, I feel a certain kindred spirit to Doug the dog from the Pixar movie Up. I, when I see shiny things, my brain goes in that different direction, so it's easy for me to get off on tangents. I have a lot of content though, so I'm going to try to minimize the amount of tangents that I go on. That said, please feel free to interrupt me at any point, please feel free to ask any questions, um, and I'm happy to address that as best as I can. I mentioned again that we'll be going through three different content areas. As you all know, social scientists love their study acronyms. PROMISE PWB is the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System, PWB for Psychological Wellbeing. MAPIT, C, is Meta Analysis of positive psychology intervention trials in cancer and empower is enhancing management of psychological outcomes with emotion regulation. I won't share how long it took me to come up with those acronyms and you don't need to remember those. Um, to start off with, when we talk about the patient reported outcome measurement information system, 
Promise initially began as this large scale measurement science effort that was designed um, spearheaded by Dave Sella, Dr. Dave Sella at Northwestern, Bryce Reeve, who at the time was at the National Cancer Institute, now he's at Duke University. What they were really interested in were trying to reduce what they called the Tower of Babel phenomenon that happens in measurement science, where there's all these different measures, investigators are tied to their pet measures and constructs, and those measures don't really talk to each other well. And so it minimizes the yield that we have from the research trials because we don't always understand what scores on one, one measure in a particular patient population mean compared to the same patient population in another study and scores on a different measure. Uh, the meaningfulness of those scores, what's clinically significant, sometimes that can be lost in translation. So PROMISE is designed to be disease agnostic. It focuses on domains of self-reported health, the big three, as defined by the World Health Organization. So mental health, physical health, and social health. It uses state of the science mixed methods, which relies not only on classical test theory, but on item response theory. Item response theory, for those of you, some of you are probably familiar with it. Those of you that aren't, it's an alternative to classical test theory. It models the likelihood that a person at a specific latent trait or symptom level will respond to an item in a particular way. And based upon that person's overall pattern of responses, IRT modeling can produce a more precise estimate of a particular symptom or domain of health-related quality of life. Another way of thinking about this is for the CESD, so a very common measure of depression, 20-item version is the standard item there. Classical test theory says for the CESD, those 20 items gives you 20 pieces of information. Item response theory takes those 20 items and it looks at individual response options. So um, I, I believe that the CSD has a five point Likert scale for each of those items. For, so for each of those 20 items, item response theory uses five different pieces of information per each item. So that gives you a hundred different pieces of data points that can allow you to create more specific scores and to potentially with computer adaptive tests, minimize response burden. So the goal of PROMISE was to be more widely applicable, free, so not constrained by intellectual property, to have more sensitive measurement approaches, more sensitive scores, because there'd be less measurement error involved and more efficient, so it reduces participant burden. Now with computer adaptive testing, I, I'm, I'm very visual, so I love how this unpacks how a computer adaptive test works. So based upon how a participant responds to uh, an initial question. In this case, the metric is for physical function, so low at the bottom, high across the top. If they respond to a score that that benchmarks their score at that one point, relatively speaking here, each subsequent question then is more precise and kind of zooms in a bit to reduce the standard error of measurement. And so for many of these computer adaptive tests, what might take 10 items, 20 items to yield a precise score, you can get the same level of precision in as few as four items. The way PROMISE is designed to work is PROMISE doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. So when they've created their item banks, they've drawn from existing measures in the research literature, existing measures that are not, sorry, existing measures that are in the public domain that are free for use, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel, piggybacks off that content, often we'll do qualitative interviews to lay out the conceptual framework for that domain. And if there's new content that needs to be written, writes those items. They really try to standardize the content based upon verb tense. They focus on uh, making sure these items are of a lower literacy level, so it can be used across, across a wide range of literacy purposes. Promise items are written so that they have a literacy level level of no greater than the sixth grade reading level. Then these items that are created go through a translatability review. They can be administered to a calibration sample. Here you see that I say toolbox calibration sample. I'm going to talk a little bit about toolbox and promise. You could think of them as almost fraternal twins. They're both large scale NIH investments in improving measurement in the clinical and the research work that we do. Toolbox work informs what we do in Promise Psychological Wellbeing, 
because they have the same scientific standards for their patient reported outcomes. But these items are then administered to a calibration sample subjected to classical test theory analysis in the form of confirmatory factor analysis and then item response theory, which uses what's essentially called a two parameter model. You want to look for items that are unidimensional and free of local independence. So unidimensionality basically want them all to hang together around the same construct and free of local independence. We want to make sure we don't have a lot of redundant content because a lot of redundant content at the item level really annoys your participants. They say, I already answered that. Are you trying to trick me? Then these items are, um, when they're analyzed at an IRT level, they really focus on what's here on the left, which I realize you probably can't see as well, is information data. So how much information is captured by that individual item and the curves on the right are the item characteristic curves for each of those responses. These items, based on the data from the item response theory, then uh, short forms are created and computer adaptive tests are created. Now, why is Toolbox, and in this case, Promise, an effective approach? Well, I've already talked about some of these things, but I would say there's at least eight unique or important aspects of what makes Promise a viable uh, approach for measurement science. It's flexible. You can use short forms computer adaptive tests. It's efficient with computer adaptive tests, minimal response burden. It has high reliability. Because items are written at no greater than a sixth grade reading level, there's age appropriateness to the measures. There's also a wealth of research that's been put into pediatric Promise measures as well. Um, Content domains are relevant. It's comprehensible in the sense that with the qualitative of the work that's been done, there's been a lot of think aloud techniques, cognitive interviews with these items, because we don't want to assume as researchers that we, when we write an item, we know exactly what we're tapping into. We want to engage with the participants and make sure that we have this nice bi-directional approach to our work. The items are interpretable because they use a T-score of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, and Promise has been translated in multiple languages. So this kind of summarizes the parallel approach between what the needs are and what Promise has to offer. I do work, as Crystal mentioned, in the adolescent and young adult oncology space, so 15 to 39-year-olds with cancer. So I have to think about measurement from the perspective of both the pediatric and the adult space but also knowing that AYAs will often have a whole host of psychosocial issues. So I wanna make sure that we can assess a breadth of health-related quality of life domains, but do it in a very efficient manner. I mentioned that the NIH toolbox could be considered as a fraternal twin, if you will, to promise. The NIH toolbox was designed to develop a core measurement battery that would take about two hours to administer and would cover four different domains of health, cognitive, motor, sensation, and emotion. Emotion was the only one of those four domains that was designed to be assessed as patient reported outcomes. We published an overview article in the journal Neurology uh, a few years back. And throughout the presentation, just side note, throughout the presentation, I'll show some screenshots of our articles. If you have any interest in what I'm talking about, feel free to take a look for a deeper dive by pulling those articles down. Um, but the emotion domain was the only one that was focused on patient reported outcomes. The others were more performance-based measures. For emotional domain, the goal was to focus on emotional health and adaptation, not focused on disorder, impairment, dysfunction, uh, based upon information that we received from our request uh, for information from content experts, the goal was or the recognition was that positive and negative aspects are not orthogonal, sorry, they are orthogonal and not just opposite ends of the same continuum. Since the overall toolbox was limited to a two hour measurement battery, that gave us 30 minutes of real estate to play with for emotional health. And that translated to 45 questions for adults and 37 items for peds. Based upon the RFP and the RFI, results, there was a strong push. This was an NIH contract too. So NIH had a lot of say, as you know, with contracts, NIH has a lot of input in terms of scoping out and guiding what 
uh, for the research to go. So based upon NIH feedback and content expert input, the goal is to focus on something that could be applicable across the age span, ages three to 85, intellectual property free. We didn't want some of those burdens or hurdles to have to jump through. Psychometrically sound, brief, easy to use, could be used with a number of different subgroups. And when possible, don't reinvent the will, leverage existing well-validated measures. So we, that little footnote there at the bottom, we reviewed 563 items as part of the whole emotional health team. We did panel testing, initial calibration testing with over 7,000 participants. And then the norming testing was done with close to 5,000 participants, both English and Spanish, and stratified by age bands, census balance by age, census balance by age, race, ethnicity, and education. So the final toolbox, we met the goal of 30 minute domain level batteries, English and Spanish versions. It had 108 instruments in total. And what it looked like at the emotional health level was there were four different subdomains of emotional health, negative affect, psychological well-being, stress and self-efficacy, stress and self-efficacy and social relationships. As you know, since we had 30 minutes to play with, we couldn't do everything in psychological well-being. We had to pick what seemed to be the most relevant for the purposes of the study. Digging into the research literature to look at hedonic and eudaimonic aspects of well being. So, hedonic focused on things like um, happiness, joy, delight, those um, somewhat transitory but important emotional states that was prioritized as important. And then we also wanted to look at those eudaimonic or those dimensions of maybe human flourishing that can be important because those experiences collectively we thought were really important, at least in the research seemed to support it, were really important for understanding what it means to live well. So that's why we settled on positive affect, life satisfaction, and meaning and purpose here. There's some areas that we would have liked to have done but couldn't because of the limitations, the constraints of our measurement battery. If you're interested in the work that we did for psychological well-being, um, this article here in Quality of Life Research does a deeper dive into that. Real briefly, what I'll say is where we landed was an item bank for positive affect of 34 items, satisfaction with life, 10, meaning and purpose of 18 items. There's a side conversation about meaning and purpose. Crystal, I'm sure I told you this at one point, but we had some pushback from the NIH initially about assessing that because it's hard when you think about lifespan assessment, what does meaning and purpose look like in the pediatric population? And we had some challenge trying to convey to them that it was important. And so we eventually settled on what we what we thought the research literature was telling us and what Chris Forrest and some of the other promised pediatric investigators were saying is you might see optimism, you might see um, a goal orientation or a, a future orientation in the pediatric population that seems to be highly linked to manifestations of meaning and purpose as those pediatric um, into, I keep saying patients because that's the world that I live in, but as pediatric individuals um, age, essentially. And as I mentioned, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So where possible, we borrowed with permission, used item content from existing measures as the core of each of these domains. Now, this is what it looks like visually, each of the item banks. Uh, just to orient you to a little bit, of what this is, these are the precision levels across the positive affect measurement continuum. Um, the X axis is the IRT scaled score or theta. So it's focused on the information of each of those items and each of those items has an individual item reliability. So that score that corresponds to the information function of 20 on the Y axis is a item level reliability of 0.95. So really good uh, for those items. So you can see across the breadth of our positive affect item bank, we do a really good job. Once it gets out to the tails, so really low positive affect or really high positive affect, we don't do as well um, in terms of limited measurement error but we still do pretty, pretty good. And across the bottom, that's kind of an upside down histogram, if you will, of our participant responses. Now, the interesting thing when we talk about item response theory is 
item response theory will allow you, because each of these items are calibrated, you can actually cherry pick. And our epidemiology colleagues love this because they just say, give me one item, give me two items. We want to use um, this as part of a CDC healthy people survey. What's the most informative item for the largest group of people? And, and we can we can give them recommendations for that. And that can yield a score that, you know, on the metric of me, T score 50 standard deviation of 10. The interesting thing is with item response theory, the fewer items you use, the more measurement error. So more items, less measurement error, you have more precision there, but you can still um, get some good items there. The interesting thing is when you look at positive items, positive affect items, you say, what are the best items? Um, what are the items that discriminate well for the majority of people who hover around that T-score of 50? And this part's not rocket science. When you look at this, I felt happy, I felt cheerful, I felt delighted, I felt joyful. It has high face validity, it has high content validity. It's not that surprising. The interesting thing is the, the science part of computer adaptive testing is, well, what happens next? If a participant gets, I felt happy, and they say often or always, what's the next best item? And the, the beauty of computer adaptive tests and item response theory is it really helps give you good precision for those subsequent items based on how a participant responds. What we found in positive affect is we, we did a bifactor analysis here. So all the items grouped well under a common positive affect um, domain. So they were unidimensional in that sense, but they also teased apart across some really interesting um, subdomains, if you will, and that was high activated positive affect. So I felt happy, cheerful, delighted, joyful, low activated positive affect. I felt peaceful. I felt content. I felt serene. I was able to relax. And then we also had another cluster that was a weak third order factor that was focused on what we called, um, I believe we called it like cognitive attention or attention in it. it. I felt attentive. I was able to concentrate. So aspects of positive affect that more focused on perhaps being present and being in tune to the moment, maybe even having a little bit of a mindfulness element to it. Life satisfaction, similar to positive affect, did really well across the range of the we call it the latent trait continuum. That's IRT language, even though we don't think of life satisfaction as a trait per se in a social and personality psychology sense. Meaning purpose was the only one that we did that just seemed a little, um, I, I'm gonna say wonky, that's not the technical term, but you can see uh, that the histogram showed that there was a skewness in the responding where participants tended to endorse higher levels of meaning and purpose. And as a result, we didn't do as well at discriminating at the lower ends of meaning and purpose. So that was a nice catalyst for me to take the work that I was doing that I started as a postdoc at Northwestern, I was doing in my early career, write a career development award. Crystal referenced that because she was one of just, I had some fantastic mentors that I had a chance to work with. And the research aim to continue this work was, let's develop new item banks to evaluate psychological well-being, and let's basically donate that to Promise because at the time, Promise with the mental, social, and physical dimensions, it had some great measures, but it hadn't done anything in the positive psychology, the psychological well-being space. With the toolbox work that we did, we were able to essentially donate those items to Promise, but we said, we can probably do a little bit better here. We hadn't done the qualitative interview data, so we went back through, took those existing items, did some think aloud interviews, and kind of unpacked each of those. This is some of what it looks like. So for positive affect, a participant, a participant might get the item. This is that first row there. They might get the item, I felt attentive with the following response options. And this participant, who is a 69-year-old man said, well, same as question 22, I felt cheerful. I, when we asked them to put it in their own words or say what it means, you said, I have a wonderful life. I'm blessed to be here. I tried to be cheerful and happy. Now, if you think about his response and you think about what that item says, I felt attentive, that showed that there was poor understanding and logic 
to that item. So we would do that for each of the items to make sure that these items were comprehensible to participants. We took those items, if there were items that were flagged because they didn't perform well with participants, we had two options. We could drop the item or we could rewrite it. We would rewrite any items that felt where we felt it was an important aspect of that content area and we didn't want to lose it, but we needed to improve on that item. Across each of those items in the item pool, we looked at readability, as I mentioned before, everything was written at no greater than the sixth grade reading level. We would look at translatability. We would do Spanish language translations to see if there are any colloquial or idiomatic expressions. We wanted things that could be easily um, translated into other languages and other cultures. We would do the cognitive interviews, and lastly, we would do an expert review to identify, okay, which items are we keeping, which items are we dropping, which items are we rewriting, and let's create our, our short form. And that process led to the expansion of the meaning and purpose item pool. Toolbox was an 18-item bank. We expanded that to 37 total items. Leveraging some of Mike Steger's work, who is one of our consultants on the project. He has a meaning in life questionnaire that has an expanded version. So we pulled in those items. We pulled in items from the pediatric promise, subjective well being measure, and we landed on a four, six, and eight item short forms. Much like the examples I gave for positive affect, where I said, this isn't that complicated when you look at the initial items that perform really well. The four best items for meaning and purpose. One, my life has meaning. Two, I have a clear sense of direction in my life. Three, I experience deep fulfillment in my life. And four, my life has purpose. Again, high face validity, high content validity. This is our four item short form. We ended up with four, six, and eight item short forms, as well as the 37 item bank, so you could administer a computer adaptive test. We also looked at construct validity as part of that. If we're creating these new measures and people are already tied to their existing measures, how does this compare? And as you can see across this, sorry, this is a, a bit busy when you look at all the constructs here, but high correlations that show high levels of convergent validity, uh, discriminant validity when you look at PANIS negative, second to last column there, um, higher correlations with meaning focused measures a little bit weaker, but still strong correlations with life satisfaction, with global mental health. So everything to suggest that what we've developed here on the surface of it looks really, really good. This is our, our focus on meta-analysis of positive psychology intervention trials in cancer. So about 10 years ago, I was at the Society of Behavioral Medicine annual conference, and I attended a symposium that was called a tale of three meta-analyses. And this symposium had some of the real heavy hitters in psychosocial oncology at the time, um, and actually that still are, Annette Stanton, uh, Paul Jacobson, I think Bonnie Spring was also part of the group, and uh, David Moore. It, they did a fantastic job talking about psychosocial interventions that are designed to target depression, pain, and fatigue. And in the psychosocial oncology literature, these are the usual suspects. These are the most common negative psychosocial outcomes that we see in patients with cancer and survivors. Again, it, it makes sense. These are some pretty common occurrences and we want to relieve human suffering. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting if we took this approach and we said, all right, what are the three most common positive outcomes? Uh, we, we recognize that, that cancer is a traumatic experience for many individuals, and yet in conversations we've had with some, uh, in some of the qualitative work, they would say, I would never wish this on my worst enemy, and yet I am so, they didn't say I'm glad, but this experience has given me a new perspective. Um, Crystal does some phenomenal work in stress-related growth. So we see this phenomenon in individuals who experience um, traumatic events is some call it post-traumatic growth, benefit finding, stress-related growth. For me, I said, all right, 
for, from a psychological well-being perspective, what are the most common dimensions here? And so positive affect, meaning purpose. I thought about life satisfaction too, but that's such a global um, kind of general quality of life. I figured it'd be really hard to pinpoint that. And I was really curious about self-efficacy more in the general or global self-efficacy because that's where it's associated with psychological hardiness or personal agency, something that might allow somebody to better cope um, with their experience. So got together my dream team. At the time, this was very much my Avengers uh, team with some great uh, library science, um, meta-analytic experts. I was working at the time with one of Larry Hedges' mentees at Northwestern. Uh, Judy Moskowitz came on board to help lead the positive affect work, Crystal to help lead the meaning and purpose work, and Tom Merluzzi at Notre Dame to help lead the self-efficacy work. So high level, just delightful people that really know this area well and complemented by another group of just bright um, investigators to round this out. Our goal was to say, does it work? What can, what can we say about the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions on positive affect, meaning purpose, and self-efficacy? And does it vary as a function of sociodemographic clinical intervention characteristics? Now, as I mentioned, our focus was not to deny, minimize, or ignore the significant stress being diagnosed with and treated for cancer. We didn't want to say, oh, don't worry, be happy here. Let's find the silver linings. Yay, isn't this great? No, not at all. We were focused on looking at a wider range of coping strategies and thinking about interventions that promote well-being so that we could equip patients to, man to better manage the deleterious effects of stress. This was a two-year project funded by an RO3. We laid it out and executed the timeline perfectly. I I'm kidding. As with most research and especially with meta-analyses. I think we ended up going closer to three years, Crystal. I, it, there was a span of me changing institutions, so um, maybe that was part of it. For our inclusion criteria, we wanted studies that focused on any types of cancer, any stage of the cancer care continuum from diagnosis, treatment, um, survivorship, including end of life, they had to have a construct related to one of our big three here. And we didn't want a uh, single arm pilot studies. We wanted some meaningful comparison groups. So we were focused on not quasi experimental. We focused on RCTs. We wanted kind of more methodologically rigorous studies here. We used Covidence, which is a web-based platform um, developed by the Cochrane collaboration, which is quirky, but is a really useful um, platform for doing systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Uh, Rater pairs reviewed abstracts to identify if they met minimal criteria. If they met minimal criteria, they would do an initial screening with a full text article to ensure that it met criteria. If they were excluded, they would provide some rationale for why they're excluded. And then if they were eligible, we would do a data extraction. Part. For each of these data points or each of these studies, we extracted some demographic and clinical characteristics, as well as aspects of the intervention and some specific outcomes. Since we were focused on intervention efficacy, we looked at the mean standard deviations and sample sizes for each of those core outcomes. We also wanted to look at if the investigator said this was a primary or secondary outcome, or maybe they didn't designate. It. And lastly, what measure did they use? Because as I mentioned at the very start, there's a whole host of measures in the psychological well-being space. There's well over a hundred of those. And we were curious about what measures are being used in these domains. For each of the three meta-analyses, we focused on an overall effect, an overall benefit of the intervention. We also were curious about the heterogeneity of effects. Are, the, are there diffuse findings here or are they more homogeneous? As I mentioned, we looked at potential moderators. Uh, does the intervention efficacy vary as a function of clinical, sociodemographic? Does it vary as a function of intervention types, modalities? And we were curious about any sort of outcome reporting bias, which is pretty common uh, when you're doing uh, systematic reviews. You want to have some indicator of the quality of the study, the quality of the reporting.
If you're interested in these studies, I was really delighted that we were able to get each of these published in really nice journal homes. For positive affect, we published that in Journal of Cancer Survivorship. For, can, uh, for meaning and purpose, that was published in Cancer with Crystal as the lead author on that. And for our self-efficacy outcomes, that was published in Psycho-Oncology. Now, briefly, what did we find? For the positive affect outcomes across 28 RCTs and over 2,000 patients and survivors, we saw a Hedges G, a benefit of 0.35. So we can think about this as a small, Hedges G small effect of 0.2, moderate 0.5. So right here, we're squarely in that small to moderate effect size, which honestly is pretty good. This is a significant finding. There were, there was considerable um, study heterogeneity here. Uh, we did find a few moderators for positive affect. In-person interventions worked better than remote. Effects were larger when they were compared to standard of care or wait list versus attention education component controls. That's probably not that surprising when you think about it because attention education component controls have a little bit more active ingredients to them typically. And lastly, survivors of early stage cancer had larger effect sizes than those with advanced stage diagnoses. And this, in hindsight, probably isn't that surprising either. I, I mentioned early on that some work in measurement science looks at high activated versus low activated positive affect, and that low activated positive affect is more of peace. I felt peaceful, I felt content, I felt serene. In this meta-analysis, most of the measures were focused on high activated positive affect. Now, if we had more peace focused, uh, serenity focused, <laughs> serenity now, we had more of those serenity types of measures, that might be more meaningful, appropriate, useful for patients who have more advanced stage cancer diagnosis. And we did not see any conclusive evidence for outcome reporting bias. For meaning and purpose, with a similar number of RCTs and over 2,000 patients and survivors, we also saw a similar benefit between small and moderate effect size. Still a lot of heterogeneity, still as a moderator variable, in-person interventions did better than remote. And interestingly here, those interventions that were specifically designed to target meaning purpose outcome did better than those that did not. Um, those of you that do work in this space know that Bill Breitbart's group from Sloan Kettering has a lot of meaning-centered group psychotherapy, meaning-centered individual psychotherapy, and a lot of that work um, was, uh, was caught by the net that we cast here, and so we think a lot of that um, was driving some of the benefit here. We did see um, a little bit of potential for small study effects in incomplete outcome reporting bias here. For the self-efficacy outcomes, this had the largest number and perhaps not surprisingly because self-efficacy can be that global type and it can be domain specific. Self-efficacy for exercise, self-efficacy for diet. Um, so a lot of RCTs here, over 8,000 patients and survivors. Again, small to moderate benefit here for interventions, still a lot of heterogeneity still inconsistent with theory and self-efficacy, some of Bandura's work, in-person interventions, where maybe you have a little bit more in-person social modeling going on that did better than the remote interventions, no conclusive evidence for outcome reporting bias. Now, here's the take home from all these interventions. If you think about the benefit that we see here, how does that compare to those big three, those usual suspects? Well, for, for psychosocial interventions that impact fatigue, pain, and depression, we see small to moderate effect sizes with the biggest benefit for depression interventions. Those gray bars there are the 95% confidence in intervals. Now, how does that look when we compare it to what we found? Well, guess what? Pretty similar. I, you know, to me, this, this as much as any slide that we've seen here shows the kind of provides validation for the work that we can do in psychosocial interventions to improve positive outcomes, there is benefit for that. There is the potential. Yes, there's still uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. There needs to be more precision with respect to measurement, more rigor in study design, but there's some enormous potential for doing work in this space. 
The last portion of my, my work today, I'll be talking about the Empower Pilot. Again, this is enhancing management of psychological outcomes with emotion regulation. This was work that began under my K, work that was done primarily with Judy Moskowitz, who had a positive affect, a positive emotions intervention that she was testing in patients with HIV and AIDS when she was at UCSF. And she has since adapt, has adapted that intervention to multiple different um, patient populations and seen some really good benefit, not only for positive emotions, but reduction in depression, anxiety, some of the more traditional negative psychosocial outcomes. Had a fantastic study team that was part of this work. And probably goes without saying, but from a well being perspective, we're not just focused on the absence of disease or infirmity, but really the presence of physical, mental, and social well being. In, in the research literature, we know that psychological well being is linked to increases in physical health, better physical health, lower risk of mortality. It's unique from the influence of distress, so it's orthogonal. We know that it's a very patient centered domain. Patients care about this in an era of patient centered care, patient centered medicine. These are some of the, some of the dimensions we should be thinking about. And to uh, echo some of Barbara Frederick, Barbara can't say that Barbara Fredrickson's work. Um, this serves very broad and build function in individuals. I mentioned that um, Judy's work has been adapted to multiple different clinical samples and seen some really good benefit in reductions in depression as well as improvements in positive affect. She's also administered this in multiple different modalities. So her intervention was a natural starting point for the work that I was doing in young adult cancer survivors. We took a look at her intervention, had uh, clinician champions also take a look at it, had AYA patient survivors take a look at it. We tweaked the language, we tweaked some of the images. We designed this to be more of a remotely delivered on demand intervention. I will often say that AYAs prefer Netflix style interventions because the research really supports remote delivery on demand sorts of interventions. The goal of our pilot, like most intervention pilots, is feasibility and acceptability. Can it be done? Do they like it? Secondarily, we wanted to see, do we find a signal in our important psychological well-being and mental well-being uh, outcomes? The way the multi-component intervention is divided, it's split up into eight empirically validated skills cl clustered in the following ways over five weeks. We took a pretty broad inclusion criteria. AYAs are at disproportionately greater risk of clinically significant levels of psychological distress, and that distress is independent of cancer stage, independent of cancer type. So we wanted basically all comers, zero to five years post active treatment. We also wanted to maximize our internal validity. We wanted uh, no cancer recurrence, no history of multiple primaries, and we wanted a more uh, relatively positive prognosis. The vast majority of AYAs will survive their cancer. The five-year survival rate for AYAs is 85%. Now it varies as a function of different cancer types, but we really wanted to zero in on um, the largest number of AYAs that we could. We had a multiple different assessments here. We, with the pilot study, we're trying a lot of different things. We had EMA, we had end of day recall for well being. Uh, we also had a more thorough pre intervention, post intervention follow up assessment. We would ask AYAs for an index of acceptability. Would they recommend these skills to a friend? Would they recommend it to someone newly diagnosed with cancer? For our well being measures, we use some of the ones that I talked about our promise, depression, short form, toolbox positive affect, short form, toolbox life satisfaction. For end of day recall, we modified items based on, upon our promise and toolbox measures so that we had an index of both negative and positive affect. The negative affect was a, was, the four item anxiety and the four item depression short forms. And we also did the same for the EMA for the experience sampling. We would ping participants three times throughout the day for the experience sampling. Here was 
we launched this study at a time when I was leaving Northwestern. So you don't need to, again, it's busy. You don't need to focus on everything here. But what I want to point out is we started with an initial letter. We did follow up phone calls with 125 participants, but that was it. So this was not a heavy handed recruitment approach. What we found from the first 18 participants that we recruited at Northwestern is that they were predominantly older. I mean, older in the AYA sense. So 15 to 39. So if you're in your thirties, you're a little bit older as an AYA. So they were older, female, well-educated breast cancer survivors. So not a very diverse sample here. What we did find is our accrual was very modest, was only 10%. That's not that unusual. AYAs have some of the poorest participation rates in cancer clinical trials, both therapeutic and supportive care trials. So 10% was right in line with published rates. Our attention was good, though, and our adherence to the intervention content was good. So we were happy with, with this, although we knew we needed to do a little bit better for accrual. What about acceptability indicators? So the average rating on a scale of zero to 10, would you recommend these skills to a friend? Most participants said, you know, nine out of 10. So we were really happy with that. What about to someone newly diagnosed with cancer? A little bit lower here, right around an average of eight. And when we talked to participants, some of them would clarify, well, it's the newly diagnosed with cancer. Because when you're newly diagnosed, you're thinking about these skills, maybe that's not the right timing. Give it a few weeks for someone to adjust, and then they're going to be in a better headspace to benefit from these interventions. So with that pilot, that initial pilot at Northwestern, recruitment feasibility was suboptimal, but retention, adherence, acceptability were good. So we said, all right, what, how are we going to improve on this? Because we were going to do one more pilot at Wake Forest. Feedback that we got with participants, I said we would do end of day recall, we did ecological momentary assessments. They hated it. They hated all of those different assessment points. And for some of them, they said, it made me think about it more and I didn't want to think about it. We knew that recruitment was slow and suboptimal, suboptimal. And we knew that participants, oh, I, I didn't say this, but we looked at the difference between the participants that dropped out versus those that stayed in the study. Those that dropped out were more likely to have lower levels of positive affect, higher levels of depression, lower levels of life satisfaction. So unfortunately, those are the people who stand to benefit the most from the intervention. So we were really sad about that because we wanted to keep them in the study because we felt we could provide something that would be really helpful for them. So what did we do in response to that? Well, we dropped the extra assessments. We, we said, we want people to stay in our intervention. We don't want them to get turned off by the assessments. If they get turned off by the intervention, that's important information. But we dropped the assessments that we didn't need. We still kept the pre, post, and one month follow-up. We dropped the end of day recall. We dropped the EMA approach. We expanded support for our study coordinators so that we could be more hands-on. We removed, we had a two week run-in period from the point that they consented until they started the intervention content. We removed that period. So if they said they wanted to do it, we gave them the content right away so they can move right into the intervention. And then we dropped the EMA component. We focused on five different touch points here. Instead of just sending a letter, maybe, maybe not calling them, we talked to their provider, we tried to be a, a presence in clinic, we used the electronic patient portal, we sent mailed letters, we sent phone calls, we tried to nudge without being annoying. Um, so we would go up to five points, if at that point they didn't respond, we considered that they were passive uh, decliners. I know you can't read this. This just shows how much more complicated and how much more detailed our approach was. So what did it look like? We ended up with 25 participants in the wave two sample, a little bit younger, not, not as predominantly female. We had a little bit more racial ethnic variability a little bit more variability with respect to education and definitely much more variability with respect to cancer type. So a much more representative sample of AYAs here. We more than doubled our accrual rate for wave two. That's great, we were so hands-on. Here's the unexpected thing that happened. Our attention dropped, our adherence dropped. What we think was happening here was 
unlike the very hands-off approach at Northwestern, we said, do you want to do this study? And if somebody said yes, they were probably committed to it. Here at Wake, because we kept nudging them and because we kept following up, we might have had some people that said, hey, sure, fine, I'll do it. But they weren't as invested, and so they were much more likely to drop out and not follow through on things. Well, what about acceptability ratings? We still had really high ratings, close to nine here. We had changed that language about recommending this intervention instead of someone newly diagnosed with cancer, we just said someone with cancer. And not surprisingly, we saw our average rating go up here. Now, what about the signal that we found for our PRO outcomes? Well, for our mental well being outcomes here, just focus on the D's, but focus on what I have here in red. So we see improvement moderate to high for some of these endpoints, for global mental health, for meaning and purpose, for uh, a reduction in anxiety and a reduction in anger even. So this was really encouraging to us. Physical well-being, not as many, but again, we weren't necessarily expecting that. This data then informed an R01 submission that we were delighted to see funded. This R01 submission is now a focused on using the multi-phase optimization strategy, which is a strategy um, that uses principles from engineering and it uses a factorial design so that you can tease apart when you have a multi-component approach, you can tease apart what's the most effective ingredient. The goal here is to optimize or reduce this five-week intervention to maybe something that's three weeks, but still has the same benefit. We still have the same level of inclusion and exclusion criteria. We're a little bit more um, inclusive of if they have a recurrence or a second primary. And this is, this looks like a nightmare because it's a 32 arm RCT, but this is because it's a factorial design. When we look at each of these components, they're gonna be collapsed across those groups. We focused on inert content in, instead of just standard of care because we were concerned about differential attrition. We took a lot of time to identify content that would be relevant to post-treatment AYA survivors and mirror it in terms of length and in terms of engageability or what we might call describe as stickiness of interventions. Uh, overly busy slide here, but again, the focus here, primary outcomes, positive affect, we hope to see a reduction in anxiety and depression for our secondary outcomes. We do for our mediating variables, think about managing emotion, self-efficacy for managing emotions as a potential mediating variable. And then we ask on a weekly basis, we try to get a sense for what's going on in their life that may be stressful. We're working with Bright Outcomes as our vendor who's helping design our intervention content. This is what the main web page looks like. This is the main home dashboard, which has a skill progress and overall progress, as well as reminders about what's coming up next. It uses a responsive design. What we have here is more of a tablet PC framework, but it's useful for a smartphone, tablet, as well as desktop PC. Our skills page, so week one, we try to have uh, again, an engaging, visually interesting sort of experience for AYAs, and that's it. I know I went through that very quickly, but I wanted to allow at least a little bit of time for Q&A, and I can stay a little bit longer, too. Yeah, I see a hand up. Uh, Catherine? Sure. Hi, Dr. Salzman. Um, thank you so much for this great presentation. My name is Catherine Bernier Carney. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Nursing here at UConn, and my clinical background is in pediatric oncology. So, uh, yeah, so very um, relevant to this topic. I just study symptoms in younger children with cancer. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, we know that peer involvement is so important in AYAs in their development, whether it's friendships in the younger AYAs or longer term relationships in older AYAs. What are your thoughts or what have you noticed about peers in well-being and, and do you see a component of peers coming into your in intervention? Yeah, such a great question because you're absolutely right. Cancer is an off time event for an AYA and it's occurring at a time when developmentally they don't want to be any different from their peers and cancer puts this big red scarlet letter C on their chest in a way. 
Um, it's, it's interesting that of the, even the outcomes that we looked at, we focused more on the intrapersonal, but if we'd focused on the interpersonal, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, that social piece. We think, and honestly, I would say privately, we worry that the benefit of this intervention as a self-guided intervention is while that's good and all, there's still that isolating component there where they don't get the connection through that. We think to increase the stickiness, doing something more socially would be helpful. We added a discussion board, which uh, it's a, we're, we're monitoring it, but it's, it's separate from our intervention. We're trying to create a little bit of a community there, but it's, it's not the primary focus. It, I, I don't think it's a, it's a good approach for what we want to do. I think if we want to do something that does a more meaningful engagement with the social piece, we might need to add a module or add some other element there that highlights that. I have a mentee at Seattle Children's who recent, that I co-mentor with Dr. Abby Rosenberg, who got a K99 grant that's looking at the social connection piece. And I don't know if you're familiar with some of Dr. Rosenberg's work, but she has this fantastic PRISM resilience intervention that's evidence-based, really promising. Um, Dr. Flatteboy, who's the mentee, is looking at building in a social support, social connection component to that. So yes, it's an important opportunity. Yes, I don't think we do it well enough. It is something downstream. We just haven't figured out, at least for my research lab, we haven't figured out how to do it well. Well, thank you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So, John, I had a question. Um, in terms of NIH uh, current receptivity to uh, interventions that have positive endpoints as their primary outcome, did you, have you had good success with that? Like, I, I, you know, our network is trying to promote research that focuses on that, and I'm just curious about, you know, when you compare the anxiety and depression and pain to these positive outcomes. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, Crystal. I, I, I have to say my experience in this space has a limited sample size. Um, that grant that I mentioned, the first time we put it in, it was not discussed. Um, and it was interesting because we went from not discussed and we put it in as a traditional R01. And we, I, I say we, we reworked it. We just dropped an aim, moved it from a five-year to a four-year R01, put it in as a modular, and it was scored, I want to say like eighth percentile and funded on the first mission there. So it... It was still the essentially the same science in the NIH. That's one of the grants that they asked to put on their website as a model of a good grant too. So we didn't really change it substantively. It's the same project. It just, I mean, you know this from being on study section, sometimes there's a little bit of luck that's involved too. I, I will say we, I've got a collaborator who talks about hiding the veggies in the mac and cheese. And, and I think that's kind of what we did with this grant is we foregrounded the distress. We foregrounded that AYEs have clinically significant levels of distress and much greater, disproportionately greater than the pediatric and the older adult space. So we led with depression and anxiety, but we didn't shy away from talking about the other things. So we had that language in there. And I think that was our attempt to be be savvy, maybe about it. It worked with it worked with one review panel, didn't work with the other one. So, I in, in terms of your broader question, is is there a, a bigger push for the NIH? I, I think, as you know, every once in a while they'll come out with some real targeted funding opportunities here. But even when I talk with my colleagues about targeted funding. They say when you look at the success rate for those targeted funding opportunities, it's often disproportionately lower. Like if you have a good idea, just go for the omnibus because you will have much more success, much more likely than getting that funded. So I think there's a lot of luck and a lot of strategic thinking about it. I wish I had a better answer for if the NIH is committed to this um, long term. I don't know. Though. 
Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, we're hoping that eventually there will be some, you know, specific interest in maybe no C's or, or RFAs, but we'll we'll see where this goes. Other other burning questions people have for for Dr. Sulfan? Hey, John, this is Sandy Chapolius here. I've been listening in. Thanks very much. I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. One of them was mine, but it doesn't have to be answered because I could ask you another time. Um, there was one from um, Nazang that wanted to hear more about your mindfulness module and how you think about the unique or overlapping benefits of mindfulness intervention for PWB outcomes. I don't know if that person is still on. Yes, they are. Yeah, great question. And Judy actually talks about this too. She she makes um, I think she apologizes and makes no apology at, at the same time. It, for those um, mindfulness purists that focus on the John Kabat-Zinn approach, with I think it's like the eight sessions, it's it, it pills in comparison to that. It, it really focuses because it's designed for a week administration. It's focused on being fully present and in, in breath awareness. So it has two important parts, but it's really kind of the tip of the iceberg for mindfulness. I think the goal there is to really teach them to kind of slow down a little bit and be in the moment and not be thinking about, you know, what the next thing is. Um, I didn't present this there, but when we asked all the participants that completed the intervention, we had them rank order of which skills were most important to them. And the top three skills, I'm gonna get the order a little bit mixed up, but the top three skills were acts of kindness, mindfulness, and gratitude. So that to me was really interesting when, when you look at the, you know, we give them opportunities to do eight different things. The, the goal setting, and personal strengths. I don't want to say they didn't like it, but relative to the other stuff, maybe it felt too performance enhancement or, or whatever, but it was the acts of kindness, mindfulness, and gratitude that they were really the most invested and interested in, that they really enjoyed and said, hey, this is something I want to keep practicing. That's great. And uh, Nah has said uh, you could do a whole separate workshop just on this one. But that said, I guess we're we're past our time and I don't know if we should you should wrap it up. Turn it to Crystal. Yeah, wow, wonderful. Well, John, thank you so much. You cover so much ground and, and hopefully people will, will follow up with you with specific questions. Um, yeah, that's really, really great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation.